Welcome to the Resilient Campus Podcast, amplifying the voices of college inclusion innovators. I'm your host, Sabi Labor, founder and CEO of Resilient Campus. Join me each week as I interview professionals on the front lines of campus and community movement building. For more information, please visit resilientcampus.com forward slash podcast. to the Resilient Campus podcast. I am very excited for you to return to the second part of my conversation with Dr. Terrell Strayhorn as we continue on for the first ever episode of season two, which highlights folks that are working at the intersection of research and scholarship and connecting that to how we do the practice or the implementation of serving students as best as we can to promote holistic forms of student success. And so Dr. Terrell Strayhorn is a prolific author, and he has published and speaks on this often, quite often, a lot more than many of us would think that we might even have time in a 24-hour day to do. So that's how Dr. Strayhorn is known. So some of the things that we talked about in this episode that you have to look forward to are this continued conversation about bridging the scholarly and the practitioner world. We know that they are as we have been taught, maybe they exist in two worlds. But really what I'm hoping to highlight with this season and this sort of theme is looking at how we are navigating both worlds simultaneously in some of our our roles or some of our initiatives. He talks really at great length about how he arrived to his role as a professor, as an administrator, and really the early origins of, of his role today in research and scholarship on issues of college access and success around his experience at UVA and how he changed his major multiple times. And there's just a really beautiful story about how he connects that today to looking to time to degree research for our college students and what we know today that maybe wasn't present in a body of knowledge back when he was navigating his own undergraduate experience. He also really shines light on the culture and the expectations of publishing for faculty and the impact that that might have on how we might perceive it as a slow adoption of research into daily practice. And so he really talks about that. And I really appreciated that conversation. The last two things that I'll mention that are really crucial that I really took away from this conversation was he talks about connecting all the P's. And these are all the people that we think of and we uplift when we're doing research and we're thinking about models of practice. We're thinking about the policymakers, the parents, and the practitioners. So we definitely want to keep all of the people central when we're thinking about student success and research in particular. And so the final thing, as we closed out our conversation, that really came up for me was thinking about how we bring our authentic self to this work. And he talks about it through an academic lens or through his lens as an administrator and a faculty member and being a professor for 13 years. And really the role and the function and the importance of bringing love and light to the world and that each of us can help students and colleagues to draw out their own light that we inherently have from within. So I really love that he brought Um, all of those topics and themes to the surface in this episode. I really hope that you enjoy it. If you are loving this model of splitting up the episode into two parts, I would love to hear from you. If it wasn't your thing, if it wasn't your cup of tea, I would love to hear that as well. So I will let you enjoy this episode. the work that you're engaged in, if I were to think of the meta level, like you're really working to engage scholarship and research bodies of knowledge and look at that, how theories really inform and how evidence and knowledge and all this scholarship informs how we do the work on the front lines, right? Like how we do that as practitioners, how we do that in classrooms and how we design these learning experiences and these points of connection, these environments where students can connect with one another, connect with their physical environment, connect with faculty, connect with other, you know, staff and mentors on the campuses. And so it sounds like you're really trying to bridge those worlds, which often are in these 
in these university and college environments can be very separate places, you know, separate water coolers, if you will, of people sort of gathering and kind of having thought partners on these, you know, in these different paradigms of experience. And and the thing that I, I think a lot of listeners are really interested in, too, is, okay, here you are doing this work today. You know, how did you arrive here? Did you intentionally sort of develop this vision of who you wanted to be in 2018 and you fulfilled X, Y, Z to do that? What brought you here? You know, I think a lot of folks who are listening in, if they're thinking about a faculty role, if they're thinking about doing this work through a scholarship lens, whether that's as a scholar practitioner or as someone, you know, whether they're in student affairs in fact, in a faculty role, you know, what guidance would you give them? So if you could talk a little bit about your path and what have you learned? Like, what would you share with someone else who said, hey, I want to do what you're doing. How can I do that? What would you what would you tell them? I think so much of what you just said is right on. I certainly have advice for folks who, you know, aspire to do good work. And and my advice and wisdom is, you know, born out of all that I've experienced to this point in my life. Again, the problem with interviews and podcasts is once you say it, it's out there, right? So, you know, um, but I'm not really ashamed of this. I, I will admit and have admitted on multiple occasions, there is no intentionality whatsoever to me arriving at this point wherever I am. It's not like I said, as you were saying, by 2018, I want to be um, on a podcast talking about, you know, what I've done over the past 13 years. Nope, never, never, never even said I want to be, you know, a professor, a full professor running a research center. That was never by design. What I did know is that ever since I could really think seriously about it, I have wanted to do something that mattered. I wanted to know, I changed my major multiple times in college, partly because I did not know myself in college. I thought, you know, I went to the University of Virginia. I'm a proud alum of UVA. Um, I thought, like most people who go to UVA, at least at the time when I went, that I was going to be a medical doctor. So I majored in biology. And I was a biology major by, like, form. I filled it out, went to my academic advisor and declared it until I took chemistry. And I loved chemistry. And so I switched to be a chemistry major. And I loved chemistry until I took calculus, too. And then I was like, oh, no, I love math. So now I'm going to be a math major. And I went back down there and declared it. At some point, they should have just said, stop coming down here. But they didn't. So I, I changed it. Um, and one day, I was speaking to a dean of students, actually the dean of resident life at UV at the time. And it's so funny because ultimately, she becomes the portal through which I enter higher education, um, the sort of human portal. So she stops me one day and says, you know, word on the street is, you change your major too much. I said, you know, I thought to myself, word on the street? Who's talking about me? And why is this something to talk about? Like you said about water coolers. She said, because people are really worried that if you keep changing your major, um, you'll be here forever. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, I mean, to that point in my life, I knew nothing about the relationship between changing your major and time to degree. Mm-hmm. Um, and now we have a whole science about that that shows students who change their majors multiple times, not only is their time to degree um, significantly more, but on average, usually students who change their major more than twice um, have a very small percent chance of ever finishing their degree, mm. um, which is why institutions said, wow, well, students do need time to think about this. So why don't we create exploration majors or some institutions went as far as saying you don't have to declare a major in your first year. So this is how research can inform practice. But the the, the connections between these worlds, as you said, is really slow. I mean, things can be in print for a decade before they ever show up in practice. And as I've learned more about this, um, the reason why is because most researchers are trained at really wonderful institutions, um, like the ones at which I've worked and the ones at which I trained, to conduct research and to publish. Mm-hmm. And publishing in the academy really is about getting it in a prestigious, privileged journal, um, and maybe a book, and then moving on to your next research discovery. And for me, having, you know, witnessed as a student turned administrator turned professor, witnessed the consequence of this gap, this delay, 
in translating research to practice, moving the publication into changes in practice, I sort of took up the mantle and said, I don't know, I'm, I'm energized by that work. I'd like to think about it. How do you connect with practitioners, connect with parents, connect with policymakers, all the P's, right? Policymakers and parents and practitioners and people. Um, and so the best way I remember, I was at a conference in Atlanta and I'd given a research talk about student success. And at the end of it, um, you know, the only, I think if I remember correctly, the title of my session was something like, with our help, all students can fly. And the only thing, and it was going well, I mean, like I had my, my, my science right, my charts were well designed, people seemed to be able to digest the information and think about um, what they would do in practice. And the only thing that would make that session just, you know, go from good to great um, was if, given the title of it, I, they, you know, with our help, they can fly, is if I had asked R. Kelly to walk in and give like a live performance of the song at the very end, <laughs> I believe I can fly, uh-huh. you know, or, or I often thought like if I had even queued up the song so that when I hit my last slide, like this started blaring through the speakers, which I don't do um, usually at all. So I'm sitting, I'm like, oh my gosh, everybody's like loving it. They got good questions. It's like the sun is shining, the birds are chirping. What can I do to really just take this session to that next level? And as I said at the beginning of our conversation, you know, I sing, I play the piano. I was a music major um, in undergrad. And without thinking too much, I grabbed a chair in the session, stood on top of it, because I'm a short dude, stood on top of it for height purposes so that people could see me. And I broke out singing, I believe I could fly. And I got lost in it because I gave them like the the gospel version of the song. (laughs) Um, and so I got lost. I only sang like one stanza. But when I finished, I was right on the verge of tears thinking about the words of the song and the impact we can have on students. And when I stopped, I mean, there was not a dry eye in the room. People were standing up, clapping and screaming and cheering. And I had never seen this at a conference session. Uh-huh. So at the end, a woman came up to me. And she was like, you know, oh, my gosh, would you come to my campus and do exactly what you did today? And I said, Sure. So I got her information, long story shorter. Um, she reaches out to me and she says, we want to bring you to come and give a keynote. And I thought, a keynote, what is that? Um, she said, exactly what you did that day. I said, oh, I thought it was a conference presentation. So what, she said, no, 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 when you're, when you're the one speaking and it's just like everyone's, it's now a keynote. So I thought, okay, mental note, that's what a keynote is. <laughs> she said, um, you know, and so what is your fee? And I thought, my fee? I, I paid for my way to Atlanta. What are you talking about? She said, no, 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 we want to bring you. So before you know it, it thrust me into this world that at the time I knew nothing about. And although I knew nothing about it, I became a student of those who knew some things about this. I think every good teacher is a good student to someone and vice versa. So I became, you know, the things I know in the classroom that my students learned from me, I started learning from folks who were in my uh, network at the time, names that p- folks in higher education might be familiar with, like Susan Comaves, who is a retired professor at the University of Maryland. I reached out to Susan at the b- the request of my advisor, Don Creamer, who said, Susan Comaves, she knows a lot about speaking. She knows a lot about consulting. I said, hey, Susan, I got this invite. They're asking me for a fee. I don't know anything about fees. Where should I start? How do I set my first? And they're asking me, like, what are my preferences for travel? I don't have any preferences. I just want to be on the plane and have it not fall. And so, um, you know, she was able to coach me through how do you set expectations and, you know, answer these questions, which was really, really wonderful. Ultimately, I, I developed a rhythm for giving these talks because that talk went well. And then someone in the audience said, hey, would you come here and talk to it? to us about it. Um, So, you know, first piece of advice for folks who say, you know, they want to do this is to just remember, sometimes you don't even know what this is. When we see people in their lane and we say, oh, I want to do that. We often think it's always been the way we see it. Mm. So, you know, I think it's really important for those who are trying to figure out what is my purpose? What's my passion? What is my lane? is to be patient with the process. And the other part is something I tell my students, I tell my family, I try to tell myself regularly, is to be yourself. I've lost some time 
in my career trying to speak like someone else, mm. trying to share the joke of another TED speaker who that went well with his audience or her audience. And then when I try it, it falls flat with my audience. Why? Because it's not my joke. It's not my experience. It's not my story. Um, but if I, my best talk are when I dare to be myself from start to finish. Mm. That's beautiful. That might mean like opening up with a story about, well, nowadays, my granddaughter, mm -hmm. you know, um, or it might mean starting with a story of a moment that I had with a student that, that really drove me to, to be convinced that belonging matters. And maybe some other speaker would say, you know, I don't, I don't start with jokes. I don't start with stories. One that I use a lot because, um, you know, I'm an adult. I was at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. I gave a keynote at the end during Q&A. Um, this is to their incoming class. I said, any questions? And a young man who's an incoming student there raised his hand. He said, I've got a question. I have a question. I've been thinking it the whole time. I said, what's your question, young man? He said, are you like an adult? I said, yes why he said you're so little you know and I said yeah I'm the fun size and the reason why <laughs> I joke about my size and I joke about my height is because actually when I was in grade school and middle school and high school it was not that comfortable to talk about you know I was bullied before I think we even had the language for bullying by people who thought just because I was small I, I didn't matter just because I was small I didn't have feelings and so I survived and now in my adult life I've been able to use it to be humorous, to lighten the, the mode, to say the obvious. I mean, I think when people see me I, all the time, the number one thing I, I get, I mean, I'm going to share a picture with you for the podcast, but the thing I get from people all the time when they meet me is like, wow, you look way bigger in your picture. You know, I don't know how you look uh -huh. bigger in a, in a, in a face <laughs> dot, but okay. <laughs> I think it's how it's cropped. Uh -huh. um, but you know, yeah, I'm a, as a fun size, uh, professor, as I like to say, um, I, that's me. And it's how I start my talks. So it might be how I end my talk. I've had social scientists, people who have doctoral degrees like us and who say to me, you're a researcher. Why do you tell so many stories? You're a quantitative researcher. You should just show your graphs and your charts. Don't, don't sing at the end of your keynote. And there have been times where I've listened to that advice and, and then, you know, got back on the plane and wondered, why didn't, why don't I feel excited about mm -hmm. that talk? Because I wasn't myself. People want, especially today, I think we have every sign in the world. What people want is they want real mm -hmm. reality television. Um, they want to, you know, the idea of being vulnerable, authentic, Daring to be yourself, you know, it's what I think underneath the the commerce and the marketing of it all. I think this is what drives Uber and Lyft is the idea that like an average person can just pick you up. You could be in the car, with just an average person in an average car. It's not a taxi. It's not a car service. It's just like an ordinary person like you could just pick you up and take you somewhere. And people like that. They're they're drawn to other people. Um, actually, that's the, one of the core elements or ingredients of belonging. And so my advice to people is, you know, rather than study you and how you do your podcast and what words does she use and how does she close the show, learn yourself, you know, spend time reflecting on what is my story? What are the lessons that I've learned from my professional life and my personal life? And then what message do I have to share with other people and how best do I share it in a way that reflects my true authentic self? That is, um, you know, if I had to just in the moment, come up with it, that's the secret of success right. for me. Um, and on days where I rob the audience of my authentic self, it shows. Um, and on days where I get afraid and I still have those days where I'm like, oh gosh, the moment, the topic requires me to disclose something that I'm not, I'm not sure I want to talk about, but when I lean in to my passion and lean into my purpose and go where the current of this work takes me. Um, magic happens is the way I like to talk about it. But when I'm hesitant and I'm in my head and I miss the moment, I end up regretting sure. it. Now, you know, as um, one of the elements that I love for people that come on the podcast to share with the listeners 
is, and we've built this tremendous resource list, um, which we're going to be sharing out in a blog post here pretty soon. But what are those, you know, I don't know if it's one or two, um, podcasts, books or resources that have been really essential to the way that you have approached your work today? Like, what would you share with people and recommend for them to either add to their reading list or their, um, you know, add to their listening queue, you know, for podcasts? But what are those resources that really, they're either the core or they're just really um, essential components or essential sort of thought pieces to doing this work? I could easily imagine that you have built this wonderful collection of resources because there's so many out there. You know, for me, there have been several things that I turn to, especially in this work. Those who follow me on social media or even who follow me today will bump into some of them. I probably will, um, before we wrap up, you know, mention my maternal grandmother, my mom's mom, who is like a She's deceased now, but she still is, and she was an educator when she was alive, but she still teaches me <laughs> today. Um, she was the one who introduced me to so many wonderful songs, mostly gospel songs, hymns that my grandmother was a choir director. And, um, and those songs have words to them that, uh, you know, as, as a kid, I thought these were just words to a song that I'm supposed to sing when I'm in my grandmother's choir. But nowadays, especially, um, you know, when I go through rough times or as I'm trying to make meaning out of chaos, it's the words to songs like There's a Bright Side Somewhere that um, that really sustain me. I, I tweet about that song quite a bit. Um, in my most recent sort of professional episode, um, you know, for those who will look me up, I went, I, I resigned from the Ohio State University in May of last year, May 3rd, um, 2017, which was my birthday. Um, and I think that was meaningful. It's not like I resigned on my birthday, by the way. It's that the end of the semester happened to be May 3rd. I don't know how that happened, but it was my birthday. And so I resigned on the last day of the semester um, and celebrated my birthday as well. And, um, but Growing up and listening to my grandmother talk about that song, I always focused on the refrain, which is there's a bright side somewhere, there's a bright side somewhere. So I just sort of say that, say that to myself, there's a bright side somewhere. When you're going through darkness, just remember there's a bright side somewhere. But the second part of that song says, don't you give up until you find it. And what really helped me get from May to now is that second part. And there have certainly been days where I was confused and lost and worried and afraid and, you know, not sure what the bright side looked like. And when I felt like giving up, whatever that might have looked like in that day, it was really the spirit of those, of that song playing in my head through my grandmother's, you know, sort of voice. Mm -hmm. Don't give up until you find it. You can't give up until you find it. When you, when you find it, you won't want to give up, but don't give up until mm -hmm. you find it. And, you know, sometimes I said it to myself almost every minute of every hour of every day to get to the next day. Sometimes I laid in my bed crying my eyeballs out and said it, but it got me there. Um, so words like that, but then certainly there have been, um, you know, quotes that I, I, I look at a lot. One of the things I talk a lot about, um, yes, I'm a social scientist. I do quantitative research on student success. I'm usually looking at survey data and looking at the relationship between um, a host of variables and outcomes like GPA and retention and persistence. But despite all of that and all of the strengths of my statistical models, what I really have come to understand is that the real strength in my own life is love and light. Um, light drives out darkness. It's enormously powerful. You know, the light that we carry, the light that we can offer other people. The reason why I talk a lot about that is because education in Latin is the word educare. If you look, out, look up the word educare, it means to draw out the light that is within. So education is all about helping young people, people like myself connect with their light. It's about helping that young man in Walmart connect with his light. It's about helping my students connect with, and in many ways, education, you know, in its fullest form, helped me connect with my own light. 
um, that I get to now, as you said earlier, you know, in public talks and lectures and in classrooms and in keynotes across the country, I get to connect the worlds and carry light and be that cross pollinating energy of good ideas. So um, love and light. The reason why that's important is because, um, you know, next month and about a week or so, I'll start my um, my my Black History Month keynotes. And this year, not to steal my own thunder, um, but I'm drawing on a number of thought leaders. Certainly, in the past, you know, I always end up talking about or from Martin Luther King during Black History Month. I'm from Virginia, so Carter G. Woodson, who's also from Virginia, is someone who I thought about his life and his life work a lot and use Black History Month as a time to educate audiences on his contributions as the founder of Black History Month, then called Negro History Week, um, back in 1926. Um, so, I mean, all of that's really important, but this year I'm going to introduce um, some thoughts by a writer who I just have enormous respect for. He's well before his time, James Baldwin. His books like Go Tell It on the Mountain and Giovanni's Room and I Am Not Your Negro have really been with me over the last year as I thought about what message do I have for campuses or the country during Black History Month this year? And secondly, um, as I've been thinking about music, because a lot of my keynotes now, it's not even that I get to just decide the thing. People say, look, we want you to come and we want you to sing. And we're going to have a piano there for you to play. So I also have to think about not only the science and the art of public speaking, but then matching it with this performance. And um, Nina Simone is someone who... I think has music that matters, has music that matters, really powerful words that are instructive in Black History Month. But she, in my, in my looking up in, you know, songs by Nina Simone, I also came across the person, mm -hmm. Nina Simone, who once said, you've got to learn to leave the table when love's no longer being served. You've got to learn to leave the table when love's no longer being served. I tweet about it. I text about it. I, I preach about it. I talk about it because it sounds really simple, but it's so powerful. If you break down the words, he didn't say you've got to leave the table. She said, you've got to learn to leave the table. And I often think, how does she know? And it's no doubt through her own experience that that is a learning process. Because when we're at the table and love is no longer being served, and only hate, and only chaos, and only conspiracies being served. What we want to do is we want to fight, we want to correct the wrongs, we want to argue, we want to be heard, and what you've got to learn to do is, is to leave the table sometimes, especially when love's not being served. Absolutely. You know, if, if love is being served, and but love is clouded, and love is confused, and but underneath the clouds and underneath the um, the chaos and underneath the rumors and underneath the misunderstanding, it's still a general sense of love. You can work on that. But the moment you sense that um, your love is being met or really even rejected by the force of hate, I think that's the best advice you have for a person is you got to learn to leave the table. Um, and then secondly, you know, um, when I was in my doctoral program, my advisor, Don Creamer, who was wonderful for me, like the young man in Walmart, Don and I couldn't be more different. I'm black. He's white. I'm from Virginia. He's from Texas. I'm, you know, on this side of, of 70. He's on the other side of 70 um, years old. And uh, so, I mean, but he was a wonderful advisor for me. Perfect. So. I say that a lot because I think when people start thinking about, you know, black men need mentors, black men might need black male mentors. Certainly, I think that black men benefit from having a cabinet of mentors, some who share their racial and gender identities. But the idea that well-intended people who have high expectations and a willingness to invest in a young person 
can't help someone because their race is different or their gender is different or their sexual orientation is different is, is, is false to me. It just doesn't hold up to the research and the science about mentoring. And it certainly doesn't hold up to my own experience with one of the greatest mentors for me. That is my doctoral advisor who would say to me things like, Terrell, you're going to do a good job one day. Um, but you no, know, he said, Terrell, you're going to have a job one day. And when you go out there, you're going to have a job. And my, he had high expectations. And he said, you're going to have one of these high, high, you know, fancy jobs with a big title. But no matter what your title is and how much they pay you, don't ever forget to do good work. And I would say, wow. Well, as I was finishing up my doctoral degree and I started thinking about these jobs, you know, as a black male, I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to be in some network of people. So I would talk to my advisor and say, hey, do you think I should go to this conference and, and hobnob? I don't think I use that term, but like, and get close to these people who I heard they have a job available at this institution. Shouldn't I go to this conference and meet this person so maybe they would think about me? And he would say, or you could just keep on doing your good work. Good work pays off. And I would say, well, Don, someone told me that they're really interested in me for this opportunity. Um, but shouldn't I try to like, you know, get their attention or make it happen sooner or follow up with them or give them a call? And he would say, or mm -hmm. you could just keep doing your good work. <laughs> you know, and that was his advice to everything. Do good work. So before you know it, I, love that. I picked up the message and that is do good work. Focus on the work. You know, it's not about networking. It's not about knowing the right people. I mean, certainly there are times where you benefit from being in the right network and around the right people. But usually, even in that network, if you, you know, do the excavation of relationships and figure out how they were established, it, they were formed around some work, some idea, something brought them together. So um, it's something I learned from my advisor. I've passed on to my students over the past 13 years, and that is to do good work. In fact, it is the inspiration for my consulting company. It was my advisor's advice that became my message to my students. My students over the years have, you know, given it back to me, not only um, in cards and in gifts and in the kind of work they're doing now as professors at the University of Missouri and Penn State and University of North Florida, University of North Carolina, Wilmington, they're all over. And I hear from their, their students at conferences that, you know, my advisor tells me to just focus on doing good work. And I love that. They've given it to me on coffee mugs. They've given it to me on T-shirts. But um, when it came time for me to start my own consulting company, I'll never forget it. I had hired a consultant, a consultant to help me start my consulting firm. Um, and they said, so what will you call it? And I said, hmm, that's a good question. They said, so, I mean, what is it you're ultimately trying to do? What do you see yourself trying to do to this consulting firm? And I said, to do good work and to help other people do good work so that students can do good work. And ultimately, we can all be engaged in good work. So before you, you know it, they said, I think it's called do good work, mm -hmm. you know, um, consult, educational consulting. Well, I posted the open letter about my decision to leave Ohio State at the turn of the year. And one of my friends, who I think on Twitter, um, his name is Michael, who lives in Memphis, tweeted me, you know, he liked the letter, but he tweeted back to me Ephesians 2 and 10, excuse me, Ephesians, a book in the New Testament of um, the Bible for those who um, know the, the text or even for, and, and as a man of faith who is a Christian, um, I, I knew Ephesians 2 and 10, but I didn't know the scriptural reference. I knew where it was. So he tweeted it and I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. I wonder what made him tweet that. And so I grabbed the Bible opened it up in Ephesians 2 and 10 says, and I read, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And I mean, I probably don't need to tell you that I, I ended up sobbing at my kitchen table that day, like, oh my gosh, I didn't know this was in here. And, uh, and I thanked Michael graciously and called him um, not only because it's kind of cool to see that life phrase and motto and the name of my consulting company in the Bible, but then again, when you break down the terms, this whole passage, I think, reflects the spirit of what I hope we've talked about in this podcast, and that is, as a professor, I know I was born May 3rd because I'm a professor. In fact, I resigned May 3rd. Why? Because I'm a professor. This is what I do. and. I could not 
not do it. And when I realized that, when I, when I, when I realized that love was no longer being served at the table and that what I was being asked to do was ultimately not be myself, I realized the need to leave the table. May 3rd, I was born to communicate, to connect to people, to share, to do what I'm doing in this lane. And this is the good work that was prepared for me in advance before I even knew what to call it or I even knew that we had like a life's purpose. Um, and my mom, if she were on your show, although if you want her, she probably would say yes and she could come back for another episode. Um, but my mom would say things like, you know, even as a kid, you always, you know, love school. You always were in your room. I would like, I educated all of my teddy bears before they, you know, before I was, you know, all of them did their homework. And, um, but the other part of it was, I feel that I have a sensitivity to the needs of people who I care about. Um, some groups I'm a member of, but some groups I'm not a member of, but through hearing people's stories or listening to them and, and so forth, um, I've developed and want to preserve always a sensitivity to the needs of the people that I think equips me to do this good work in a way that is different from the, the norm, from the average person in, in this space. And, um, and that's what I've really been fighting to um, reconnect with. And certainly, as I think about the future, that's what I'm, I'm optimistic about and excited about is the opportunity to um, reconnect and re-enter to commit myself to this kind of work and doing it this way so that ultimately all boats, especially, you know, boats that have not um, historically been served, that those boats are lifted. Um, and to do that, we've got to understand the condition of everyone's boat is not the same. Everybody doesn't have a boat. Some people have like a little paddle boat, but they're, and they're doing the best they can to just stay above water. And um, I think it takes the innovative social justice warrior um, to fight for those who have the least. And especially in today's time where um, you got to be creative because the mindsets, you know, racism, sexism, homophobia, all those things are still pervasive. They just don't show up like they used to. You know, they don't show up the way they talk about in history books. Absolutely. And so the social justice warrior to me today has to be quick on their feet and they have to be um, they have to have a, a discerning spirit to be able to sense like, oh, my gosh, that's an inequitable policy. It doesn't really look like it. You know, like the other week and I'll stop here. Um, the other week I was somewhere and thought about an interview I had with. Um, so we've been doing research now with foster youth and it was a foster youth in an interview that helped me realize how. Um, ill fit higher education is for them, how higher education does not accommodate the needs. I don't even really think about it. It's not designed for foster youth. Why? At the first class that this foster youth um, had in higher education, first semester, first day, at the end of the class, the professor says, take out a sheet of paper. I want to give you your homework. And immediately this foster youth in an interview shares with me the trauma that he experienced. Shaking thinking, caught in his head, and he started thinking, wait, homework? His foster youth happens to be homeless? Well, he's de facto homeless in the sense that he's now in college and out on his own. And the supports he would have benefited from through the social services system prior to, he'd aged out of all of that, right? So here he is trying to think about independent living, thinking about being, and the term homework, where do you do homework? Well, it's not just foster youth who are homeless. There are lots of um, students in higher education who are homeless or face all sorts of insecurities. And sometimes our language triggers thoughts, anxiety, notions that I do not belong here for students. And when I share that story with people, they're like, oh my gosh, I've never even thought about that. Of course you haven't, because we've moved through this privileged space. You know, to us, Homework is done at home, or it might be done at a coffee shop, or it might be done at your friend's house. But we don't worry about the language because it has nothing to do with us. It's 
so far removed from our own experience. And what I'm trying to do is help not only do good work and do good research, but to sensitize the entire system of higher education to the realities of these newcomers who we know relatively little about. And I think it's our understanding of their experience that will awaken us to the supports that they need, which will give us what we need to start building those supports and maybe even the strategy to connect them to those supports so that ultimately they can find success. That's wonderful. And so Terrell, you know, in a, in the effort to connect you with other social justice warriors, other folks that are doing this work, doing the good work today, what's the best platform for people to connect with you? Is it, is it Twitter? Is it LinkedIn? How can people add you to their network and start to build, um, those relationships? I'm quite active on, I mean, I wish I could be even more active than I am on, um, all things social media. One thing is I use the same ID. So it's, T.L. Strayhorn, Terrell Lamont Strayhorn, on all things social media, Twitter, Instagram, on Facebook, I use my my real name. Facebook is not the best way to connect with me because I already have whatever it is that Facebook limits your friends to. Um, I have a personal page. It is distinct from the other because my middle name, Lamont, is used. Terrell Lamont Strayhorn is my personal page, and it's maxed out with friends, but I have a uh, for a public figure page, Terrell L. Strayhorn, that you can also connect with me through. I'd say my preferred ways of connecting with people happen to be through Twitter or LinkedIn. So certainly that information will be shared with you. I welcome you to connect with me. If you have a question, I'm always happy to then tag offline through phone or Skype if circumstances require. Perfect. Thank you so much, Terrell. I really appreciate all your time, all the stories and the personal and professional insights that you've shared today. It's really been great, you know, for me, get to know you a bit more through just the stories that you've been sharing today. And I look forward to us getting to know each other better and to reading your book that's coming out. That's very exciting. As we close out today, and you shared the two inspirational quotes, I don't know if you want to just reread those two quotes so that we can send folks back out into the world today. Oh, I'd love to. One from Nina Simone, who once said, you've got to learn to leave the table when love's no longer being served. And then for all of those, you know, who see themselves engaged in doing important work, work that is not just self-serving, but work that really inspires others, transforms communities, strengthens families and neighborhoods, what I call good work, just to know that there's affirmation for the kind of work we're doing. And this is not to those who share my uh, my religious beliefs. I think that, you know, I was, a re- I said earlier, I was a music major at um, the University of Virginia and I had a double major. I was a music major and a religious studies major and religion at UVA as an undergrad is taught really like a history of people. So to me, even if your spiritual or religious beliefs do not drive a commitment to the Bible, seeing the Bible just as a text, a best selling text of, a lo- of all time, Even in Ephesians 2 and 10, it encourages those of us who see ourselves doing good work to continue this good work, to know that we were predestined to do this good work and that it matters, where it reads Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good work, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He prepared for us in advance to do. And I shared with everyone on the podcast, you know, I posted this open letter about my own professional matter at the turn of the year. I've heard from hundreds and hundreds of people, not just claps and likes to the open letter, but I've heard from 30, 40 people who said, I'm going through the same thing now. You know, I'm, I see myself doing good work in my job and I'm, I'm now in the middle of this challenge and challenging situation or um, chaos has erupted. And so I um, take the liberty to speak to those of you who might listen to this podcast who are thinking about some difficulties that you're facing professionally or even personally. And I give you the advice that I got from my mom when I was trying to sort through my own situation. My mom said to me, she said, hey, Rail, my name is Terrell. They always call me Rail. That's my nickname. She said, hey, Rail, didn't you tell me some time ago that you see yourself out there fighting for the underdog? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, didn't you tell me that you're out here trying to do good work so that other people can, I don't know, have a fighting chance that 
um, getting education, having a better tomorrow, then I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I thought one time you told me that you are driven to do this work. It's not about the salary. It's not about the reputation or the recognition, but it's really about helping somebody see the light. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, didn't you think you were going to have to go through some darkness sometimes? Didn't you think that you were going to have to go through difficult situations so that you could be touched by their situation? It would keep you closer to them so that you would have, so that when you speak or when you write, you're writing from not just what you learned in the academy, but the power that only experience can give you. And I said, yes, ma'am. With tears in my eyes, I said, yes, ma'am. So to those of you who are listening to the podcast, who are trying to sort through your own personal, professional chaos and struggle and define meaning and understand that you matter, your work matters. Sometimes difficult times come to propel us to that next great place. And so hang on. And the words of my grandmother, there's a bright side somewhere. But the, the part that I want you to hear as we close out this podcast in my grandmother's voice, if she were here, she'd say, don't you give up until you find it. There's a bright side somewhere. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Dr. Terrell Strayhorn. To all those listening in, thank you so much for all that you do. I truly appreciate you. Stay resilient. Thanks so much for tuning in. Head on over to iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss out on a single episode. 